Dear people watching and listening, Assalamu alaikum. Kindly like and share this video with your friends and family and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please support my channel by contributing to my Patreon account so that I can continue making the audiobook series. Is the Bible God's Word? Start of Chapter 1 What They Say Christians Confess Dr. W. Graham Scroggy of the Moody Bible Institute, Chicago, one of the most prestigious Christian evangelical mission in the world, answering the question, Is the Bible the Word of God? Also the title of his book, under the heading, It is Human Yet Divine, says on page 17, Yes, the Bible is human, though some out of zeal which is not according to knowledge have denied this. Those books have passed through the minds of men, are written in the language of men, were penned by the hands of men, and bear in their style the characteristic of men. Another erudite Christian scholar, Kenneth Cragg, the Anglican Bishop of Jerusalem, says on page 277 of his book, The Call of the Minaret, Not so the New Testament. There is condensation and editing. There is choice, reproduction and witness. The Gospels have come through the mind of the Church behind the authors. They represent experience and history. If words have any meaning, do we need to add another word of comment to prove our case? No, but the professional propagandists, after letting the cat out of the bag, still have the face to try to make their readers believe that they have proved beyond the shadow of any doubt that the Bible is the refrigerable word of God. Their semantic gymnastics, equivocating and playing with words, is amazing. But these doctors of religion are telling us in the clearest language, humanly possible, that the Bible is the handiwork of man, all the while pretending that they are proving to the contrary. An old Arab saying goes, If such are the priests, God bless the congregation. With this sort of drivel, the hot gospeler and the Bible thumper is inspired to harry the heathen a theological student, a not yet qualified young evangelist from the University of Witwatersrand, became a frequent visitor to the new town mosque in Johannesburg with the noble thoughts of witnessing to the members of its congregation. When I was introduced to him and having learned his purpose, I invited him to lunch at my brother's residence, a stone's throw from the mosque. While discussing the authenticity of the Bible over the dinner table and sensing his stubborn dogmatism, I put out a feeler. Your Professor Giezer, the head of the Department of Theology, does not believe that the Bible to be the Word of God. Without the slightest surprise, he answered, I know. Now I personally had no knowledge of the Professor's conviction about the Bible. I had only assumed so from a controversy which raged around him about the divinity of Christ. He had taken issue with the orthodox believers on this point some years ago. I continued further, saying, Your lecturer does not believe the Bible as being God's word. The young evangelist responded again, I know. But he continued this time with the words, But I believe that it is the word of God. There is no real remedy for such people. Even Jesus bewailed the sickness. Seeing they see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Holy Bible, Matthew, chapter 13, verse 13. Al-Qur'an, the holy book of God, also condemns this malish mentality. Summum bukmun umyun. Deaf, dumb and blind. They will not return to the path. Holy Quran, Surah Baqarah, Chapter 2, Verse 18. These pages are now addressed to those sincerely humble souls 
who are genuinely interested in seeking the light of God and who wish to be guided by it. As for the other, with a sickness in their souls, the facts presented herein can only increase the disease of their hearts. End of chapter 1 Is the Bible God's Word? Start of chapter 2 The Muslim's Standpoint Presumptuous Christians, whether Catholic, Protestant or occultist, of the thousand and one sects and denominations of Christianity, never will you find a missionary who will not, prima facie, presuppose that his potential convert accepts his holy Bible as the book of final authority on every religious opinion. The only answer the prospective proselyte has is to quote verses from the Bible which are contradictory to the missionaries or debate their interpretations. The Dogged Question When the Muslim proves his point from the Christian's own holy scripture, and when the professional priest, parson or predicant cannot refute the arguments, the inevitable Christian evasion is, do you accept the Bible as God's word? On the face of it, the question seems to be an easy one but a simple yes or no cannot be given as an answer. You see, one has first to explain one's position, but the Christian will not give one the opportunity. He gets impatient. Answer yes or no, he insists. The Jews did the same to Jesus 2,000 years ago, except that surprisingly he was not straight-jacketed, as is the fashion today. The reader will readily agree that things are not always either black or white. Between these two extremes there are various shades of grey. If you say yes to his question, then it would mean that you are prepared to swallow everything, hook, line and sinker, from Genesis to Revelation from his Bible. If you respond with a no, he quickly unhooks himself from the facts you have presented and rallies support from his co-religionists in the audience with you see, this man does not believe in the Bible. What right has he to expound his case from our book? With this type of argument, he rests content that he has safely evaded the issue. What is the Muballik to do? He has to explain his position vis-a-vis -vis the Bible as he ought to do. Muballik is the propagator of Islam. Three Grades of Evidence we Muslims have no hesitation in acknowledging that in the Bible there are three different kinds of witnessing recognizable without any need of specialized training. These are 1. You will be able to recognize in the Bible what may be described as the Word of God. 2. You will also be able to discern what can be described as the words of a prophet of God. 3 and you will most readily observe that the bulk of the Bible is the records of eyewitnesses or ear witnesses or people writing from hearsay. As such, they are the words of a historian. You do not have to hunt for examples of these different types of evidences in the Bible. The following quotations will make the position crystal clear. The first type, A. I will raise them up a prophet, and I will put my words in him, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Holy Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18. B. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Saviour. Holy Bible, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 11. C. Look unto me, and be ye saved all the end of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Holy Bible, Isaiah, chapter 45, verse 22. Note the first person pronoun singular emphasized in the above references, and without any difficulty you will agree that the statements seem to have the sound of being God's word. The second type, A. Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Holy Bible. Matthew, chapter 27, verse 46. 
B. And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Holy Bible, Mark, chapter 12, verse 29. C. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Holy Bible, Mark, chapter 10, verse 18. Even a child will be able to affirm that Jesus cried, Jesus answered, and Jesus said, are the words of the one to whom they are attributed, that is the words of a prophet of God. The third type. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he, Jesus, came, if haply he, Jesus, might find anything thereon, and when he, Jesus, came to it, he, Jesus, found nothing but leaves. Holy Bible, Mark chapter 11, verse 13. The bulk of the Bible is a witnessing of this third kind. These are the words of a third person. Note the underlined pronouns. They are not the words of God or of his prophet, but the words of a historian. For the Muslim, it is quite easy to distinguish the above types of evidence because he also has them in his own faith. But of the followers of the different religions, he is the most fortunate in this that his various records are contained in separate books. 1. The first kind, the Word of God, is found in a book called the Holy Quran. 2. The second kind. The words of the Prophet of God, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, are recorded in the books of traditions called the Hadith. 3. Evidence of the third kind abounds in different volumes of Islamic history, written by some of high integrity and learning and others of lesser trustworthiness, but the Muslim advisedly keeps his books in separate volumes. The Muslim keeps the above three types of evidence jealously apart and their proper gradations of authority, he never equates them. On the other hand, the Holy Bible contains a motley type of literature, which comprises the embarrassing kind, the sordid and the obscene, all under the same cover. A Christian is forced to concede equal spiritual import and authority to all, and is thus unfortunate in this regard. End of chapter 2 Is the Bible God's Word? Start of chapter 3 The Multiple Bible Versions It will now be easy for us to analyze a Christian's claim about his holy book. Separating the wheat from chaff Before we scrutinize the various versions, let us clarify our own belief regarding the books of God. When we say that we believe in the Torah, the Zabur, the Injil and the Qur'an, what do we really mean? We already know that the Holy Qur'an is the infallible word of God, revealed to our Holy Prophet, Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, word for word, through the agency of the Archangel Jibreel alayhi salam, known as Gabriel in English and perfectly preserved and protected from human tampering for the past 1400 years. Even hostile critics of Islam have grudgingly vouched for the purity of the Holy Qur'an. There is probably in the world no other book which has remained 12 centuries, now 14 plus, with so pure a text. Sir William Muir The Torah we Muslims believe in is not the Torah of the Jews and the Christians, Though the words, one Arabic, the other Hebrew, are the same, we believe that whatever the Holy Prophet Moses salam, preached to his people was the revelation from God Almighty. But that Moses was not the author of those books attributed to him by the Jews and the Christians. Likewise, we believe that the Zabur was the revelation of God granted to Hazrat Dawud salam but that the present psalms associated with his name are not that revelation. The Christians themselves do not insist that David is the sole author of his psalms. What about the Injil? 
Injil means the gospel or good news which Jesus Christ preached during his short ministry. The gospel writers often mention Jesus going about and preaching the gospel, the Injil. 1. And Jesus went preaching the gospel and healing every disease among the people. Holy Bible, Matthew, chapter 9, verse 35. 2. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. Holy Bible, Mark, chapter 8, verse 35. 3. Preach the gospel. Holy Bible, Luke, chapter 20, verse 1. The gospel is a frequently used word. But what gospel did Jesus preach? Of the 27 books of the New Testament, only a small fraction can be accepted as the words of Jesus. The Christians post about the Gospels according to St. Matthew, according to St. Mark, according to St. Luke, and according to St. John. But there is not a single Gospel according to St. Jesus himself. We sincerely believe that everything Christ salam, preached was from God. That was the Injil the good news and the guidance of God for the children of Israel. In his lifetime, Jesus never wrote a single word, nor did he instruct anyone to do so. What passes off as the Gospels today are the works of anonymous hands. The question before us is, do you accept that the Bible is God's word? The question is really in the form of a challenge. The questioner is not simply seeking enlightenment. The question is posed in the spirit of a debate. We have every right to demand in a similar vein, which Bible are you talking about? We may ask. Why? There is only one Bible, he mutters. The Catholic Bible. Holding the Douay Roman Catholic version of the Bible aloft in my hand, I ask, do you accept this Bible as the word of God? For reasons best known to themselves, the Catholic Truth Society have published their version of the Bible in a very short, stumpy form. This version is a very odd proportion of the numerous versions in the market today. The Christian questioner is taken aback. What Bible is that? he asks. Why, I thought you said that there was only one Bible, I remind him. Yes, he murmurs hesitantly. But what version is that? Why would that make any difference? I inquire. Of course it does, and the professional preacher knows that it does. He is only bluffing with his one Bible claim. The Roman Catholic Bible was published at Reims in 1582, from Jerome's Latin Vulgate and reproduced at Douai in 1609. As such, the RCV, Roman Catholic Version, is the oldest version that one can still buy today. Despite its antiquity, the whole of the Protestant world, including the cults, condemn the RCV because it contains seven extra books, which they contemptuously refer to as the Apocrypha. That is of doubtful authority. Notwithstanding the dire warning contained in the Apocalypse, which is the last book in the RCV, renamed as Revelation by the Protestants, it is revealed if any man shall add to these things or delete, God shall add unto him the plagues written in this book. Holy Bible, Revelation, chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. But who cares? They do not really believe. The Protestants have bravely expunged seven whole books from their book of God. The outcasts are the book of Judith, the book of Tobias, the book of Baruch, the Book of Esther, etc. The Protestant Bible So Winston Churchill has some pertinent things to say about the authorized version of the Protestant Bible, which is also widely known as the King James Version, KJV. The authorized version of the Bible was published in 1611 by the will and command of His Majesty King James I, whose name it bears still today. 
The Roman Catholics, believing as they do that the Protestants have mutilated the Book of God, are yet aiding and abetting the Protestant crime by forcing their native converts to purchase the authorized version of the Bible, which is the only Bible available in some 1500 languages of the lesser developed nations of the world. The Roman Catholics milk their cows, but the feeding is left to the Protestants. The overwhelming majority of Christians, both Catholics and Protestant, use the authorized AV or the King James Version, KJV, as it is alternatively called. Glowing Tributes First published, as Sir Winston says, in 1611, and then revised in 1881, RV, and now re-revised and brought up to date as the Revised Standard Version, RSV 1952, and now again re-re-revised in 1971, still RSV for short. Let us see what opinion Christendom has of this most revised Bible, the RSV. 1. The finest version which has been produced in the present century. Church of England Newspaper. 2. A completely fresh translation by scholars of the highest eminence. Times Literary Supplement. 3. The well-loved characteristics of the authorized version combined with the new accuracy of translation. Life and work. 4. The most accurate and close rendering of the original. The Times. The publishers, Collins themselves, in their notes on the Bible at the end of their production, say on page 10, This Bible, RSV, is the product of 32 scholars, assisted by an advisory committee representing 50 cooperating denominations. Why all this boasting? To make the gullible public buy their product? All these testimonies convince the purchaser that he is backing the right horse while the purchaser little suspecting that he is being taken for a ride. The World's Best Seller But what about the authorized version of the Bible, A.V., the World's Best Seller? These revisers, all good salesmen, have some very pretty things to say about it. However, their page 3, paragraph 6 of the preface of the RSV reads, The King James Version alternative description of A.V., has with good reason been termed the noblest monument of English prose. Its revisers in 1881 expressed admiration for its simplicity, its dignity, its power, its happy turns of expression, the music of its cadences, and the felicities of its rhythm. It entered, as no other book has, into the making of the personal character and the public institutions of the English-speaking peoples. We owe to it an incalculable debt. Can you, dear reader, imagine a more magnificent tribute being paid to the book of books than the above? I, for one, cannot. Let the believing Christian now steal himself for the unkindest blow of all from his own beloved lawyers of religion. For in the very same breath they say, yet the King James Version has grave defects. And that these defects are so many and so serious as to call for revision. This is straight from the horse's mouth, that is, the orthodox Christian scholars of the highest eminence. Another galaxy of doctors of divinity are now required to produce an encyclopedia, explaining the cause of those grave and serious defects in their holy writ and their reasons for eliminating them. End of chapter 3 Is the Bible God's Word? Start of chapter 4 50,000 Errors The Jehovah's Witnesses in their Awake magazine, dated 8 September 1957, carried this startling headline, 50,000 Errors in the Bible. While I was still formulating the theme of this booklet, I heard a knock at my door one Sunday morning. I opened the door. A European gentleman stood there, grinning broadly. Good morning, he said. Good morning, I replied. 
he was offering me his awake and watchtower magazines. Yes, a Jehovah's Witness. If a few had knocked at your door previously, you will recognize them immediately. The most supercilious lot of people who ever knocked at people's doors. I invited him in. As soon as he settled down, I produced a full reproduction of what you see on the screen. Pointing to the monograph at the top of the page, I asked, Is this yours? He readily recognized his own. I said, It says 50,000 errors in the Bible. Is it true? What's that? He exclaimed. I repeated. I said that it says that there are 50,000 errors in your Bible. Where did you get that? He asked. This was published 35 years ago when he was perhaps a little nipper. I said, leave the fancy talk aside. Is this yours? Pointing again to the monograph. Awake, he said. Can I have a look? Of course, I said. I handed him the page he started perusing. They, the Jehovah's Witnesses, are trained. They attend classes five times a week in their kingdom halls. Naturally, they are the fittest missionaries among the thousand and one sects and denominations of Christendom. They are taught that when cornered, do not commit yourself to anything. Do not open your mouths. Wait for the Holy Ghost to inspire you with what to say. I silently kept watching him while he browsed the page. Suddenly he looked up. He had found it. The Holy Ghost had tickled him. He began. The article says that most of those errors have been eliminated. I asked, if most are eliminated, how many remain out of the 50,000? 5,000? 500? 50? Even if 50 remain, do you attribute those errors to God? He was speechless. He excused himself by suggesting that he will come again with some senior member of his church. That will be the day. If I had this booklet ready, I would have offered him saying, I would like to do you a favor. Give me your name and address and your telephone number. I will lend you this booklet. It's the Bible, God's Word, for 90 days. I want a written reply. If you do this, and a few other Muslims do the same, they and the other missionaries will never darken your doors again. I believe that this publication will prove the most effective talisman to date. Insha'Allah. This cult of Jehovah's Witnesses, which is so strong in its condemnation of the Orthodox Trinitarians for playing with the Word of God, is itself playing the same game of semantic gymnastics. In the article under review, 50,000 errors in the Bible, they say there are probably 50,000 errors, errors that have crept into the Bible text, 50,000 such serious errors. Most of those so-called errors as a whole, the Bible is accurate. We do not have the time and space to go into the tens of thousands of grave or minor defects that the authors of the Revised Standard Version, RSV, have attempted to revise. We leave that privilege to the Christian scholars of the Bible. Here I will endeavor to cast just a cursory glance at half a dozen or so of those minor changes. 1. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Holy Bible, Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14, from A.V. The indispensable virgin in the above verse has now been replaced in the RSV with the phrase a young woman, which is the correct translation of the Hebrew word Alma. Alma is the word which has occurred all along in the Hebrew text and not Betula which means virgin. This correction is only to be found in the English language translation as the RSV is only published in this tongue. For the African and the Afrikaner, the Arab and the Zulu, in fact, in the 1500 other languages of the world, Christians are made to continue to swallow the misnomer virgin. Begotten, not made. Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. Begotten, not made. 
is an adjunct of the orthodox catechism leaning for support on the following. 2. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Holy Bible, John, chapter 3, verse 16 from A.V. No priest worth his cloth would fail to quote the only begotten of the Father when preaching to a prospective convert. But this fabrication, begotten, has now been unceremoniously excised by the Bible revisers without a word of excuse. They are silent as church mice and would not draw the reader's attention to their furtive excision. This blasphemous word, begotten, was another of the many such interpolations in the Holy Bible. God Almighty condemned this blasphemy in the strongest terms soon after its innovation. He did not wait for 2,000 years for Bible scholars to reveal the fraud. And they say, God most gracious has begotten a son. Indeed, ye have put forth a thing most monstrous. At it the skies are ready to burst, and the earth to split asunder, and the mountains to fall down in utter ruin, that they should invoke a son for God most gracious. For it is not consonant with the majesty of God most gracious. That he should beget a son. Holy Quran, Surah Maryam, chapter 19, verses 88 to 92. The Muslim world should congratulate the 50 cooperating denominations of Christendom and their brains trust the 32 scholars of the highest eminence bringing their holy bible a degree nearer to the quranic truth lam yalid wa lam yulad he god almighty begets not nor is he begotten holy quran surah ikhlas chapter 112 verse 3 christian mathematics 3 for there are three that bear record in heaven the father the word and the holy ghost and these three are one. Holy Bible, first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7, from the A.V. This verse is the closest approximation to what the Christians call their Holy Trinity in their encyclopedia called the Bible. This keystone of the Christian faith has also been scrapped from the RSV without even a semblance of explanation. It has been a pious fraud all along and well deservedly has it been expunged in the RSV for the English-speaking people. But for the 1,499 remaining language groups of the world who read the Christian concoction in their mother tongues, the fraud remains. These people will never know the truth until the Day of Judgment. However, we Muslims must again congratulate the galaxy of DDs who have been honest enough to eliminate another lie from the English RSV Bible, thus bringing their holy book yet another step closer to the teachings of Islam. For the Holy Quran says, وَلَا تَقُولُوا سَلَاسَ And don't say Trinity. إِنْتَهُ خَيْرَ لَكُمْ Desist, it will be better for you. إِنَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَاهٌ وَاحِدٌ For Allah is one God. Holy Quran Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 171. The Ascension One of the most serious of those grave defects which the authors of the RSV had tried to rectify concerned the ascension of Christ. There have been only two references in the canonical Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and of John to the most stupendous event in Christianity, of Jesus being taken up into heaven. These two references were obtained in every Bible in every language prior to 1952 when the RSV first appeared. These were 4a. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, 
was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Holy Bible, Mark chapter 16, verse 19, 4b. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. Holy Bible, Luke chapter 24, verse 51. Now look at this, which is a photocopy where the quotation 4a above ought to appear. You will be shocked to note that Mark 16 ends at verse 8, and after an embarrassing expanse of blank space, the missing verses appear in small print as a footnote at the bottom of the page. If you can lay your hands on a RSV 1952, you will find the last six words of 4b above, that is, and was carried up into heaven replaced by a tiny K to tell you to see the footnote if you please, where you will find these missing words. Every honest Christian has to admit that he does not consider any footnote in any Bible as the word of God. Why should the paid servants of Christianity consign the mightiest miracle of their religion to a mere footnote? From the chart, the origin and growth of English Bible, you will note that all the biblical versions prior to the revised version of 1881 were dependent upon the ancient copies, those dating only five or six hundred years after Jesus. The revisers of the RSV 1952 were the first Bible scholars who were able to tap the most ancient copies, fully dating three and four centuries after Christ. We agree that the closer to the source, the more authentic is the document. Naturally, most ancient deserves credence more than mere ancient, but not finding a word about Jesus being taken up or carried up into heaven in the most ancient manuscripts, the Christian fathers expurgated those references from the RSV 1952. The Donkey Circus The above facts are a staggering confession by Christendom that the inspired authors of the canonical Gospels did not record a single word about the ascension of Jesus. Yet these inspired authors were unanimous in recording that their Lord and Saviour rode a donkey into Jerusalem as his mission drew to a close. And they sat him thereon, the donkey. Holy Bible, Matthew chapter 21, verse 7. And he sat upon him, the donkey. Holy Bible, Mark. Chapter 11, verse 7 And they set Jesus thereon, the donkey. Holy Bible, Luke, chapter 19, verse 35 Jesus sat thereon, the donkey. Holy Bible, John, chapter 12, verse 14 Could God Almighty have been the author of this incongruous situation? going out of his way to see that all the gospel writers did not miss their recording of his son's donkey ride into the holy city, and yet inspiring them to black out the news about his son's heavenly flight on the wings of angels? Not for long. The hot gospelers and the Bible thumpers were too slow in catching the joke. By the time they realized that the cornerstone of their preaching, the ascension of Jesus, had been undermined as a result of Christian biblical erudition. The publishers of the RSV had already raked in a net profit of $15 million. The propagandists made a big hue and cry, and with the backing of two denominational committees out of the 50, forced the publishers to reincorporate the interpolations into the inspired word of God. In every new publication of the RSV after 1952, the expunged portion was restored to the text. It is an old, old game. The Jews and the Christians have been editing their book of God from its very inception. The difference between them and the ancient forgers is that the ancient forgers did not know the art of writing prefaces and footnotes, otherwise they too would have told us clearly as our modern heroes have about their tampering and their glib excuses for transmuting forged currency into glittering gold. Many proposals for modification were submitted to the committee by individuals and by two denominational committees. All of these were given careful attention by the committee. Two passages, the longer ending of Mark, chapter 16, 
verses 9 to 20, and Luke chapter 24, verse 51, are restored to the text. Preface, Collins page 6 and 7. Why restored? Because they have been previously expunged. Why had the references to the Ascension expunged in the first place? The most ancient manuscripts had no references to the Ascension at all. They were interpolations similar to 1 John chapter 5 verse 7 about the Trinity. Why eliminate one and reinstate the other? Do not be surprised. By the time you lay your hands on a RSV, the committee might also have decided to expunge the whole of their invaluable preface. The Jehovah's Witnesses have already eliminated 27 revealing pages of their foreword to their New World Translation of the Christian Greek Scriptures. This is their way of saying New Testament. Allah in the Christian Bible The Reverend C. I. Schofield, D.D., with a team of eight consulting editors, also all D.D.'s in the Schofield Reference Bible, thought it appropriate to spell the Hebrew word Ilah, meaning God, alternatively as Allah. The Christians had thus swallowed the camel. They seem to have accepted at last that the name of God is Allah, but were still retaining at the Gnat by spelling Allah with one L. References were made in public lectures to this fact by the author of this booklet. Believe me, the subsequent Schofield Reference Bible has retained word for word the whole commentary of Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, but has by a clever sleight of hand blotted out the word Allah altogether. There is not even a gap where the word Allah once used to be. This is in the Bible of the Orthodox. One is hard pressed to keep up with their jugglery. End of chapter 4 Is the Bible God's Word? Start of chapter 5 Damning Confessions Mrs. Ellen G. White, a prophetess of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, in her Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 14, has this confession to make about the affordability of the Holy Bible. The Bible we read today is the work of many copyists, who have in most instances done their work with marvelous accuracy. But copyists have not been infallible, and God most evidently has not seen fit to preserve them altogether from error in transcribing. In the following pages of her commentary, Mrs. White testifies further, I saw that God had especially guarded the Bible. From what? Yet when copies of it were few, Learned men had in some instances changed the words, thinking that they were making it plain, when in reality they were mystifying that which was plain, by causing it to lean to their established views, which were governed by tradition. Developed Sickness The mental malady is a cultivated one. This authoress and her followers can still trumpet from rooftops that, truly, the Bible is the infallible word of God. Yes, it is adulterated, but pure. It is human, yet divine. Do words have any meaning in their language? Yes, they have in their courts of law, but not in their theology. They carry a poetic license in their preaching. In their hearts is a disease. And Allah has increased their disease. Wallahum azabun alim, and grievous is the penalty they incur. Bimakanu yakzibun, because they are false to themselves. Holy Quran, Surah Baqarah, Chapter 2, Verse 10. The Witnesses The most vociferous of all the Bible thumpers are the Jehovah's Witnesses. On page 5 of their foreword, mentioned earlier, they confess in copying the inspired originals by hand. The element of human frailty entered in, and so none of the thousands of copies extant today in the original language are perfect duplicates. The result is that no two copies are exactly alike. Now you see why the whole foreword of 27 pages is eliminated from their Bibles. 
Allah was making them to hang themselves with their own erudition. Potluck Out of every 24,000 differing manuscripts the Christians boast about, the church fathers just selected four which tallied with their prejudices, their preconceived notions, and called them Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We will deal with each of them in their proper place. Here, let us go over the conclusion of the Jehovah's Witnesses' research, as recorded in the now expunged foreword. The evidence is, therefore, that the original text of the Christian Greek scriptures has been tampered with, the same as the text of the Seventy has been. Yet this incorrigible cult has the effrontery to publish nine million copies as a first edition of a 192-page book entitled Is the Bible Really the Word of God? We are dealing here with a sick mentality, for no amount of tampering, as they say, will appreciably affect the authenticity of the Bible. This is Christian logic. A patient hearing. Dr. Graham Scroggy, in his aforementioned book, pleads on page 29 for the Bible. And let us be perfectly fair as we pursue the subject. Is the Bible the word of God? Bearing in mind that we are to hear what the Bible has to say about itself. In a court of law, we assume that a witness will speak the truth and must accept what he says unless we have good grounds for suspecting him or can prove him a liar. Surely the Bible should be given the same opportunity to be heard and should receive a like patient hearing. The plea is fair and reasonable. We will do exactly as he asks and let the Bible speak for itself. In the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, there are more than 700 statements which prove not only that God is not the author of these books, but that even Moses himself had no hand in them. Open these books at random and you will see. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down. And Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, and the Lord said unto Moses, Get down, charge the. It is manifest and apparent that these are neither the words of God nor of Moses. They indicate the voice of a third person writing from hearsay. Moses writes his own obituary. Could Moses have been a contributor to his own obituary before his demise? Did the Jews write their own obituaries? So Moses died. And he, God Almighty, buried him, Moses. He was one twenty years old when he died, and there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses. Holy Bible, Deuteronomy, chapter 34, verses 5 to 10. We will analyze the rest of the Old Testament presently from other angles. End of chapter 5. Is the Bible God's word? Start of chapter 6 Book Christ and the New Testament Why according to? What about the so-called New Testament? Why does every gospel begin with the introduction according to, according to? Why according to? Because not a single one of the wanted 24,000 copies extant carries its author's autograph. Hence the supposition according to. Even the internal evidence proves that Matthew was not the author of the first gospel which bears his name. And as Jesus passed forth tents, he, Jesus, saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he, Jesus, said unto him, Matthew, follow me, Jesus. And he, Matthew, arose and followed him, Jesus. Holy Bible, Matthew. Chapter 9, verse 9 Without any stretch of the imagination, one can see that he's and the hymns of the above narration do not refer to Jesus or Matthew as its author, but some third person writing what he saw and heard. A hearsay account. If we cannot even attribute this book of dreams 
as the first gospel is also described to the disciple Matthew, how can we accept it as the word of God? We are not alone in this discovery that Matthew did not write the gospel according to St. Matthew, and that it was written by some anonymous hand. J.B. Phillips concurs with us in our findings. He is the paid servant of the Anglican Church, a prebendary of the Chichester Cathedral, England. He would have no reason to lie or betray to the detriment of the official view of his church, refer to his introduction to the Gospel of St. Matthew. Phillips has this to say about its authorship. Early tradition ascribed this Gospel to the Apostle Matthew, but scholars nowadays almost all reject this view. In other words, St. Matthew did not write the Gospel which bears his name. This is the finding of Christian scholars of the highest eminence, not of Hindus, Muslims and Jews who may be accused of bias. Let our Anglican friend continue. The author, whom we still can conveniently call Matthew, conveniently, because otherwise every time we made a reference to Matthew, we would have to say, the first book of the New Testament, chapter so and so, verse so and so, and again and again the first book, etc. Therefore, according to J. B. Phillips, it is convenient that we give the book some name. So why not Matthew? Suppose it is a good a name as any other, Phillips continues. The author has plainly drawn on the mysterious cue which may have been a collection of oral traditions. What is this mysterious cue? Cue is short for the German word quella, which means sources. This is supposed to be another document, a common source, to which our present Matthew, Mark and Luke had access. All these three authors, whoever they were, had a common eye on the material at hand. They were writing as if looking through one eye, and because they saw eye to eye, the first three Gospels came to be known as the Synoptic Gospels. Wholesale Cribbing but what about that inspiration business? The Anglican prebendary has hit the nail on the head. He is more than anyone else entitled to do so. A paid servant of the church, an orthodox evangelical Christian, a Bible scholar of repute, having direct access to the original Greek manuscripts, let him spell it out for us. Notice how gently he lets the cat out of the bag. He, Matthew, has used Mark's gospel freely, which in the language of the school teacher has been copying wholesale from Mark. Yet the Christians call this wholesale plagiarism the word of God. Does it not make you wonder that an eye witness and an ear witness to the ministry of Jesus, which the disciple Matthew was supposed to be, instead of writing his own first hand impressions of the ministry of his Lord, would go and steal from the writings of a youth? Mark, who was a ten-year-old lad when Jesus upbraided his nation? Why would an eyewitness and ear witness like Matthew copy from a fellow Mark, who himself was writing from hearsay? The disciple Matthew would not do any such silly thing, for an anonymous document has been imposed on the fair name of Matthew. Plagiarism or Literary Kidnapping Plagiarism means literary theft. Someone copies verbatim, word for word, from another's writing and palms it off as his own, is known as plagiarism. This is a common trait amongst the forty or so anonymous authors of the books of the Bible. The Christians boast about a supposedly common code among the writers of the 66 Protestant booklets and the writers of the 73 Roman Catholic booklets called the Holy Bible. Some common court there is for Matthew and Luke, or whoever they were, had plagiarized 85% word for word from Mark. God Almighty did not dictate the same wordings to the synoptists, one-eyed. The Christians themselves admit this, because they do not believe in a verbal inspiration, as the Muslims do about the Holy Quran. This 85% plagiarism of Matthew and Luke pales into insignificance compared to the literary kidnapping of the authors of the Old Testament, where a 100% stealing occurs in the so-called Book of God. 
Christian scholars of the caliber of Bishop Kenneth Gregg euphemistically call this stealing, reproduction, and take pride in it. Perverted Standards Dr. Scroggy most enthusiastically quotes in his book a Dr. Joseph Parker for his unique eulogy of the Bible. What a book is the Bible in the matter of variety of contents. All pages are taken up with obscure names and more is told of a genealogy than of the Day of Judgment. Stories are half told and the night falls before we can tell where victory lay. Where is there anything in the religious literature of the world to correspond with this, a beautiful nexus of words and phrases undoubtedly? It is much, it is much ado about nothing and rank blasphemy against God Almighty for authorizing such an embarrassing hotspot. Yet the Christians gloat over the very defects of their books, like Romeo over the mole on Juliet's lip. Nothing less than 100%. To demonstrate the degree of plagiarism practiced by the inspired Bible writers, I asked my audience during a symposium at the University of Cape Town, conducted between myself and Professor Kumpstee, the head of the Department of Theology on the subject, is the Bible God's Word, to open their Bibles. Some Christians are very fond of carrying their Bibles under their arms when religious discussions or debates take place. They seem to be utterly helpless without this book. At my suggestion, a number of the audience began ruffling the pages. I asked them to open chapter 37 in the book of Isaiah. When the audience was ready, I asked them to compare my Isaiah 37 with their Isaiah 37 while I read to see whether they were identical. I began reading slowly, verse 1, 2, 4, 10, 15, and so on, until the end of the chapter. I kept on asking after every verse if what I had been reading was identical with the verse in their Bibles. Again and again they chorused, yeah, yeah. At the end of the chapter, with the Bible still open in my hands at the place from which I had been reading, I made the chairman to reveal to the audience that I was not reading from Isaiah 37 at all, but from 2 Kings 19. There was a terrible consternation in the audience. I had thus established 100% plagiarism in the Holy Bible. In other words, Isaiah 37 and 2 Kings 19 are identical word for word, yet they have been attributed to two different authors, centuries apart, whom the Christians claim have been inspired by God. Who is copying from whom? Who is stealing from whom? The 32 renowned Bible scholars of the RSV say that the author of the Book of Kings is unknown. These notes on the Bible were prepared and edited by the Right Reverend David J. Fant, Lit D, General Secretary of the New York Bible Society. Naturally, if the most reverend gentleman of Christendom had an iota of belief about the Bible being the Word of God, they would have said so, but they honestly, shamefacedly confess, author unknown. They are prepared to pay lip service to scriptures which could have been penned by any Tom, Dick or Harry and expect everyone to regard these as the word of God. Heaven forbid. No verbal inspiration. What have Christian scholars to say about the book of Isaiah? They say, mainly credited to Isaiah, parts may have been written by others. In view of the confessions of Bible scholars, we will not take poor Isaiah to task. Can we then nail this plagiarism on the door of God? What blasphemy! Professor Kumpsi confirmed at question time at the end of the aforementioned symposium that the Christians do not believe in a verbal inspiration of the Bible. So God Almighty had not absent mindedly dictated the same tale twice. Human hands, all too human had played havoc with this so-called word of God, the Bible. Yet Bible thumpers will insist that every word, comma, and full stop of the Bible is God's word. 
End of chapter 6 Is the Bible God's Word? Start of chapter 7 The Acid Test How do we know that a book claimed to be from God is really the book of God? One of the tests, out of many such tests, is that a message emanating from an omniscient being must be consistent with itself. It ought to be free from all discrepancies and contradictions. This is exactly what the Last Testament, the Book of God, says. Do they not consider the Qur'an with care? Had it been from any other than Allah, they would have found therein many a discrepancy. Holy Qur'an, Surah Nisa, Chapter 4, verse 82 God or the Devil If God Almighty wants us to verify the authenticity of his book, the Holy Qur'an, with this acid test, why should we not apply the very same test to any other book claiming to be from him? We do not want to bamboozle anybody with words as the Christians have been doing. It would be readily agreed from the references I have given from Christian scholars that they have been proving to us that the Bible is not the word of God, yet making us believe that they have actually convinced us to the contrary. A classic example of this sickness was in evidence again only yesterday. The Anglican Synod was in session in Grahamstown. The Most Reverend Bill Burnett the archbishop was preaching to his flock. He created a confusion in his Anglican community. An erudite Englishman, addressing a group of learned English priests and bishops in their own mother tongue, English, which his learned colleagues drastically misunderstood to such an extent that Mr. Macmillan, perhaps also an Anglican, the editor of an English daily, the Natal Mercury, dated December 11, 1979, had this to say about the confusion the Archbishop had created among his own learned clergy. Archbishop Burnett's remarks at the Synod were hardly a model of clarity and were widely and dramatically misinterpreted by many of those present. There is nothing wrong with English as a language, but we know that the Christian is trained in muddled thinking in all matters religious. The bread in his Holy Communion is not bread, but flesh. The wine is blood, three is one, and human is divine. But do not make a mistake. He is not that simple when it comes to dealing with the earthly kingdom, where he is then most precise. You will have to be doubly careful when entering into a contract with him. He can have you sold out without your realizing it. The examples that I shall furnish in substantiating the points I have raised about the contradiction in the so-called Book of God would be found very easy, even for a child to follow and understand. While the author of Samuel 24 above makes God the boss of the situation, the author of Chronicles gives credit to the devil. Apart from showing allegiance to God as is noted elsewhere, the devil, Satan, is also given his due. This dichotomy on the part of the author of Chronicles reminds one of the story of the old woman who lit one candle to St. Michael and another to the devil, so that whether she went to heaven or hell, she would have a friend. This Chronicles fellow made sure that he had a friend at court above as well as a friend at court below. He wanted to have it both ways, or wanted to have his cake and eat it too. You will observe that the authors of the books of Chronicles and of Samuel are telling us the same story about David taking a census of the Jews. Where did David get his inspiration to do this novel deed? The author of 2 Samuel, chapter 24, verse 1, says that it was the Lord God who moved, RSV incited, David, but the author of 1 Chronicles, chapter 21, verse 1, says that it was Satan who provoked David to do such a dastardly thing.
How could the Almighty God have been the source of these contradictory inspirations? Is it God or is it Satan? In which religion is the devil synonymous with God? I am not talking about Satanism, a recent fungus growth of Christianity, in which ex-Christians worship the devil. Christianity has been most prolific in spawning isms, atheism, communism, fascism, totalitarianism, Nazism, Mormonism, Moonism, Christian Scientism, and now Satanism. What else will Christianity give birth to? The Holy Bible lends itself to all kinds of contradictory interpretations. This is the Christian boast. Some claim, and rightly so, that biblical passages have been continuously misused and misappropriated to justify almost every evil known to man. From the plain truth, an American-based Christian journal under the heading, The Bible, World's Most Controversial Book, July 1975. Who are the real authors? As further evidence will be adduced from Samuel and Chronicles, I deem it advisable first to determine their authors instead of ascribing those books incongruities to God. The revisers of the RSV say, A. Samuel, author unknown, just one word. B. Chronicles, author unknown, probably collected and edited by Ezra. We must admire the humility of these biblical scholars, but their possibilities, probabilities, and likelies are always construed as actualities by their fleeced sheep. Why make poor Ezra or Isaiah the scapegoats for these anonymous writers? What did the Lord decree? Three years famine or seven years famine? If God is the author of every single word, comma, and full stop in the Bible, as the Christians claim, then is he the author of the above-mentioned discrepancy as well? 3 or 7 Compare both the quotations. 2 Samuel chapter 24 verse 13 tells us, So God came to David and told him and said unto him. These words are repeated word for word in 1 Chronicles chapter 21 verse 11. Except the redundant and told him is removed. But while trimming the useless phrase, the author also pruned the time factor from seven years to three years. What did God say to God? Three or seven years plague on both your houses? 8 or 18. Compare the two quotations. 2 Chronicles chapter 36 verse 9 tells us that Jehoiachin was eight years old when he began to reign while 2 Kings chapter 24 verse 8 says that he was 18 when he began to reign. The unknown author of Kings must have reasoned that what possible evil could a child of 8 do to deserve his abdication. So he generously added 10 years to make Jehoiachin mature enough to become liable to God's wrath. However, he had to balance his tampering, so he cut short his reign by 10 days. Add 10 years to age and deduct 10 days from rule? Could God Almighty say two widely differing things on the same subject? How old was Jehoiachin? 8 or 18? Between 8 and 18 years. There is a gap or difference of a full 10 years. Can we say, God forbid, that the all-knowing Almighty could not count and thus did not know the difference between 8 and 18? If we are to believe in the Bible as the word of God, then the dignity and status of the Lord Almighty will hit an all-time low. Cavalry or Infantry Compare the two quotations. How many chariot riders did David slay? 700 or 7,000? And further, did he slay 40,000 horsemen or 40,000 footmen? The implication in the conflicting records between 2 Samuel chapter 10 verse 18 and 1 Chronicles chapter 19 verse 18 is not only that God could not discern the difference between hundreds and thousands, but that he could not even distinguish cavalry from infantry. It is obvious that blasphemy masquerades in the Christian dictionary as inspiration.
practical homework. Solomon in his glory began building a royal palace for himself, which took him 13 years. We learn this from the first book of Kings, chapter 7. You remember Dr. Parker's boast about whole pages being taken up by obscure names? Well, for sheer puerility, you cannot beat this chapter 7 and Ezekiel chapter 5. You owe it to yourself to read it just once in your lifetime. After that, you will really appreciate the Holy Quran. Obtain your own Bible and color code it for easy reference. You may color the various references from this booklet in your Bible yellow for all contradictions, red for pornographic passages, and green for sensible, acceptable quotations as the ones I have mentioned at the beginning of this essay. That is words that you can effortlessly recognize as being those of God and his holy messengers. With just this preparation, you will be ready to confute and confuse any missionary or Bible scholar that comes your way. If we perspire more in times of peace, we will bleed less in times of war. Chiang Kai shek. How hygienic. Note that the author of 1 Kings, chapter 7, verse 26, has counted 2,000 bats in Solomon's palace. But the author of 2 Chronicles, chapter 4, verse 5, increases the kingly count by 50% to 3,000. What extravagance and error in the book of God! Even if God Almighty had nothing else to do, would he occupy himself inspiring such trivial contradictory nonsense to the Jews? Is the Bible God's book? Is it the word of God? Piled Contradictions Before I conclude this series of contradictions, let me give you just one more example. There are hundreds of others in the Bible. It is Solomon again. He really does things in a big way. The ex-Shah of Iran was a nursery kid by comparison. The author of 2 Chronicles, chapter 9, verse 25, gives Solomon 1,000 more stalls of horses than the number of bats he had given him. And Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses. But the author of 1 Kings, chapter 4, verse 26, had real kingly thoughts about his royal patron. He multiplied Solomon's stalls by 1,000%, from 4,000 to 40,000 stalls of horses. Before some glib evangelist draws the wool over your eyes that the difference is only a knot, a zero, that some scribe or copyist had inadvertently added a zero to 4,000 to make 40,000, let me tell you that the Jews in the time of Solomon knew nothing about the zero. It was the Arabs who introduced the zero to the Middle East and to European countries later. The Jews spelt out their figures in words in their literary works and did not write them in numerals. Our question is, who was the real author of this staggering discrepancy of 36,000? Was it God or man? You will find these references and many more allied facts in a very comprehensive book, The Bible, Word of God or Word of Man, by A.S.K. Jumel. End of chapter 7 Is the Bible Word of God? Start of chapter 8 Most Objective Testimony The Christian propagandist is very fond of quoting the following verse as proof that his Bible is the word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Holy Bible, 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16, from A.V. by Schofield. Note the is in capitals. Reverend Schofield is telling us silently that they do not occur in the original Greek. The New English Bible translated by a committee representing the Church of England, the Church of Scotland, the Methodist Church, the Congregational Church, the Baptist Union, the Presbyterian Church of England, etc., etc., and the British and Foreign Bible Society has produced the closest translation of the original Greek which deserves to be reproduced here. Every inspired scripture has its use for teaching the truth and refuting error. 
of our reformation of manners and discipline in right living. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 The Roman Catholics in their Douay version are also more faithful to the text than the Protestants in their authorized version. They say, All scripture, inspired of God, is profitable to teach, to reprove, to correct. We will not quibble with words. Muslims and Christians are agreed that whatever emanates from God, whether through inspiration or by revelation, must serve one of four purposes. 1. It must either teach us doctrine. Two. Reprove us for our error. 3. Offer us correction. 4. Guide us into righteousness. I have been asking learned men of Christianity for the past 40 years whether they can supply a fifth peg to hang the word of God on. They have failed signally. That does not mean that I have improved upon their performance. Let us examine the Holy Bible with these objective tests. Not far to seek. The very first book of the Bible, Genesis, provides us with many beautiful examples. Open chapter 38 and read, We are given here the history of Judah, the father of the Jewish race, from whom we derive the names Judea and Judaism. This patriarch of the Jews got married and God granted him three sons, Er, Onan, and Shelah. When the firstborn was big enough, Judah had him married to a lady called Tamar. But Er, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. Genesis chapter 38 verse 7 Under what heading from the above four principles of Timothy will you place this sad news? The second, reprove, is the answer. Er was wicked, so God killed him. A lesson for all. God will destroy us for our wickedness. Reproof. Continuing with this Jewish history, according to their custom, if a brother died and left no offspring, it was the duty of the other brother to give seed to his sister-in-law, so that the deceased's name might be perpetuated. Judah, in honor of this custom, orders his second son Onan to do his duty. But jealousy enters his heart. It will be his seed, but the name will be his brother's. So at the climactic moment, he spilled it on the ground. And the thing he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. Genesis chapter 38 verses 9 and 10 Again, where does this slaying fit into Timothy's tests? Reproof is the answer again. No prizes are offered for these easy answers. They are so basic. Do wrong and bear the consequence. Onan is forgotten in the Book of God, but Christian sexologists have immortalized him by referring coitus interruptus as onanism in their books of sex. Now Judah tells his daughter-in-law Tamar to return to her father's house until his third son Shelah attains manhood, when she will be brought back so that he can do his duty. A woman's revenge. Shelah grows up and is perhaps married to another woman. But Judah had not fulfilled his obligation to Tamar. Deep in his heart he is terrified. He has already lost two sons on account of this witch. Lest peradventure he, Shelah, die also, as his brethren did. Genesis chapter 38 verse 11 So Judah conveniently forgets his promise. The aggrieved young lady resolves to take revenge on her father-in-law for depriving her of her seed right. Tamar learned that Judah is going to Timnath to share his sheep. She plans to get even with him on the way. She forestalls him and goes and sits in an open place en route to Timnath. When Judah sees her, he thinks she is a harlot because she had covered her face. He comes up to her and proposes. Allow me to come in unto thee. And she said, What wilt thou give me, that thou mayest come in unto me? He promises that he would send her a goat kid from his flock. What guarantee could she have that he would send it? What guarantee did she require, Judah queried? His ring, his bracelet, and his staff is the ready answer. The old man hands those possessions to her, 
and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. Holy Bible. Genesis chapter 13 verses 16 to 18. The Moral Lesson Before we seek the heading from Timothy chapter 3 verse 16, under which to categorize this filthy, dirty story from the book of God, I am tempted to ask, as you would be tempted to ask, what is the moral lesson that our children will learn from Tamar's sweet revenge? Of course, we do tell our children fables, not really for their entertainment value, but that through them some moral may be imparted. The fox and the grapes, the wolf and the lamb, the dog and his shadow, etc. However simple or silly the story, a moral is aimed at. Christian Parental Dilemmas Dr. Vernon Jones, an American psychologist of repute, carried out experiments on groups of school children to whom certain stories had been told. The heroes of the stories were the same in the case of the different groups of children, but the heroes behaved contradictorily to each other. To one group, St. George slaying the dragon emerged a very brave figure, but to another group, fleeing in terror and seeking shelter in his mother's lap. These stories made certain slight but permanent changes in character, even in the narrow classroom situation, concluded Dr. Jones. How much more permanent damage the rapes and murders, incests and bestialities of the Holy Bible have done to the children of Christendom can be measured from reports in our daily newspapers. If such is the source of Western morality, it is no wonder then that Methodists and Roman Catholics have already solemnized marriages between homosexuals in their houses of God, and 8,000 gays, an euphemistic term for sodomites, parade their wares in London's Hyde Park in July 1979 to the acclaim of the news and TV media. You must get that holy Bible and read the whole chapter 38 of Genesis. Mark in red the words and phrases deserving this adornment. We have reached verse 18 in our moral lesson, and she conceived by him. Can't hide forever. Three months later, as things were bound to turn out, news reached Judah that his daughter-in-law Tamar had played the harlot, and that she was with child by Hodem and Judah said, Bring her forth and let her be burnt. Genesis chapter 38 verse 24 Judah had deliberately spurned her as a witch, and now he sadistically wants to burn her. But this really Jewess was one up on the old man. She sent the ring, the bracelet, and the staff with a servant, beseeching her father-in-law to find the culprit responsible for her pregnancy. Judah was in a fix. He confessed that his daughter-in-law was more righteous than himself, and he knew her again no more. Verse 26 It is quite an experience to compare the choice of language in which the different virgins describe the same incident. The Jehovah's Witnesses in their New World Translation translate the last quotation as He had no further intercourse with her after that. This is not the last we will hear about in the Book of God of this Tamar, whom the Gospel writers have immortalized in their genealogy of their Lord. Incest Honored I do not want to bore you with details, but the end verses of Genesis 38 deal with the duel in Tamar's womb about the twins struggling for ascendancy. The Jews were very meticulous about recording their firstborns, the firstborn got the lion's share of their father's patrimony. Who are the lucky winners in this prenatal race? There are four in this unique contest. They are Ferez and Zarah of Tamar by Judah. How? You will see presently. But first, let us have the moral. What is the moral in this episode? You remember Ir and Onan, how God destroyed them for their several sins? and the lessons we have learnt in each case was reproof. Under what category of Timothy will you place the incest of Judah and his illegitimate progeny? All these characters are honoured in the Book of God for their bastardy. They become the great-grandfathers and great-grandmothers of the only begotten Son of God.
See Matthew chapter 1 verse 3. In every version of the Bible, the Christians have varied the spelling of these characters' names from those obtained in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 38, with those contained in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, to put the reader off the scent, from Pharez in the Old to Paris in the New, and Zarah to Zara and Tamar to Tamar. But what about the moral? God blesses Judah for his incestuous crime. So if you do evil, her, God will slay you. If you spill seed, Onan, God will kill you. But the daughter-in-law, Tamar, who vengefully and guilefully collects her father-in-law's Judah's seed, is rewarded. Under what category will the Christians place this honor in the book of God? Where does it fit? Is it your 1. Doctrine 2. Reproof 3. Correction or 4. Instruction into righteousness. Ask him who comes and knocks at your door, that professional preacher, that hot gospeler, that Bible thumper. Here he deserves a prize if he can advance an explanation for the correct answer. There is none born who can justify this filth, this pornography under any of the above headings. But a heading has to be given. It can only be recorded under pornography. Ban the book. George Bernard Shaw said that the Bible is the most dangerous book on earth. Keep it under lock and key. Keep the Bible out of your children's reach. But who will follow his advice? He was not a B.A., a reborn Christian. According to the high moral scruples of the Christian rulers of South Africa, who have banned the book Lady Chatterley's Lover because of a tetragamation, a four-lettered word they would most assuredly have placed a ban on the Holy Bible if it had been a Hindu religious book or a Muslim religious book. But they are utterly helpless against their own holy book. Their salvation depends upon it. Reading Bible stories to children can also open up all sorts of opportunities to discuss the morality of sex. An unexpurgated Bible might get an X rating from some censors. The Plain Truth, October 1977. Daughters seduce their father. Read Genesis 19, verses 30 to the end and mark again in red the words and phrases deserving this honor. Do not hesitate and procrastinate. Your colored Bible will become a priceless heirloom for your children. I agree with Shaw to keep the Bible under lock and key, but we need this weapon to meet the Christian challenge. The Prophet of Islam said that war is strategy, and strategy demands that we use the weapons of our enemy. It is not what we like and what we do not like, it is what we are forced to use against the one book, Bible. Professors, who always knock on our doors with the Bible says this and the Bible says that. They want us to exchange our Holy Quran for their Holy Bible. Show them the holes in the holiness, which they have not yet seen. At times these robots pretend to see the filth for the first time. They have been programmed with selected verses for their propagation. History has it that, night after night, the daughters of Lot seduced a drunken father with the noble motive of preserving their father's seed. Seed figures very prominently in this holy Bible, 47 times in the little booklet of Genesis alone. Out of this another incestuous relationship comes, the Ammonites and the Moabites, for whom the God of Israel was supposed to have had special compassion. Later on in the Bible, we learn that the Jews are ordered by the same compassionate God to slaughter the Philistines mercilessly. Men, women and children, even trees and animals are not to be spared, but the Ammonites and the Moabites are not to be harassed, distressed or meddled with because they are the seed of Lot. Deuteronomy chapter 2 verse 19 No decent reader can read the seduction of Lot to his mother sister or daughter, not even to his fiancée if she is a chaste and moral woman. Yet you will come across perverted people who will gorge this filth. Tastes can be cultivated.
Read again and mark Ezekiel 23. You will know what color to choose. The whoredoms of the two sisters, Aholah and Aholibah. The sexual details here put to shame even the unexpurgated editions of many banned books. Ask your born-again Christian visitors under which category will they classify all this lewdness. Such filth certainly has no place in any book of God. End of chapter 8 Is the Bible God's Word? Start of chapter 9 The Genealogy of Jesus Watch now how the Christian fathers have hoisted the incestuous progenies of the Old Testament upon their Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ in the New Testament. For a man who had no genealogy, they have manufactured one for him. And what a genealogy! Six adulterers and offsprings of incest are imposed upon this holy man of God, men and women deserving to be stoned to death according to God's own law as revealed through Moses, and further to be ostracized and debarred from the house of God for generations. Ignoble Ancestry Why should God give a father, Joseph, to his son Jesus? And why such an ignoble ancestry? This is the whole of beauty of it, says the pervert. God loved the sinner so much that he disdaineth not to give such progenitors for his son. Only two commissioned. Of the four gospel writers, God inspired only two of them to record the genealogy of his son. To make it easy for you to compare the fathers and grandfathers of Jesus Christ, in both the inspired lists, I have culled the names only, minus the verbiage. Between David and Jesus, God inspired Matthew to record only 26 ancestors for his son. But Luke also inspired, gathered up forty-one forefathers for Jesus. The only name common to these two lists between David and Jesus is Joseph, and that too a supposed father according to Luke chapter 3 verse 23. This one name is glaring. You need no fine tooth comb to catch him. It is Joseph the carpenter. You will also easily observe that the lists are grossly contradictory. Could both the lists have emanated from the same source, that is God? Fulfilling prophecy Matthew and Luke are overzealous in making David the king, the prime ancestor of Jesus, because of that false notion that Jesus was to sit on the throne of his father David. Acts chapter 2 verse 30 the Gospels belie this prophecy, for they tell us that instead of Jesus sitting on his father's, David's throne, it was Pontius Pilate, a Roman governor, a pagan who sat on that very throne and condemned its rightful heir, Jesus, to death. Never mind, says the evangelist, if not in his first coming, then in his second coming he will fulfill this prophecy and three hundred others beside but with their extravagant enthusiasm to trace the ancestry of Jesus physically to David. For this is actually what the Bible says, that of the fruit of his, David's loins, according to the flesh, literally, not metaphorically, Acts chapter 2 verse 30, both the inspired authors trip and fall at the very first step. Matthew chapter 1 verse 6 says that Jesus was the son of David, through Solomon. But Luke chapter 3 verse 31 says that he, Jesus, was the son of David through Nathan. One need not be a gynecologist to tell that by no stretch of the imagination could the seed of David reach the mother of Jesus, both through Solomon and Nathan at the same time. We know that both the authors are confounded liars, because Jesus was conceived miraculously without any male intervention. Even if we concede a physical ancestry through David, both authors would still be proved liars for the obvious reason. Breaking Prejudice As simple as the above logic is, the Christian is so emotionally involved that it will not penetrate his prejudiced mind. Let us give him an identical example. 
but one where he can afford to be objective. We know from history that Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was the son of Abraham alayhi salam through Ishmael alayhi salam. So if some inspired writer came along and tried to palm off his revelation to the effect that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the son of Abraham alayhi salam through Isaac alayhi salam, we would, without any hesitation, brand such a writer as a liar. Because the seed of Ibrahim alayhi salam could never reach Amina, Muhammad's mother, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, through Ishmael alayhi salam, and through Isaac alayhi salam at the same time. The differences of lineage between these two sons of Ibrahim alayhi salam is the difference between the Jews and the Arabs. In the case of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we would know then that anyone who says that Isaac alayhi salam is his progenitor was a liar. But in the case of Jesus, both Matthew and Luke are suspect. Until the Christians decide which line of ancestors they prefer for their God, both Gospels will have to be rejected. Christendom has been battling tooth and nail with these genealogies for the past 2000 years, trying to unravel the mystery. They have not given up yet. We admire their perseverance. They still believe that time will solve the problem. Perhaps another 2000 years? There are claimed contradictions that theologians have not resolved to every atheist's satisfaction. There are textual difficulties with which scholars are still wrestling. Only a Bible illiterate would deny these and other problems. The Plain Truth, July 1975. The source of Luke's inspiration. We have already nailed 85% of Matthew and Luke to Mark or that mysterious cue. Let us now allow Luke to tell us who inspired him to tell his most excellent Theophilus. Luke chapter 1 verse 3, the story of Jesus. He tells us plainly that he was only following in the footsteps of others who were less qualified than himself. Others who had the temerity to write accounts of his hero Jesus as a physician, as against fishermen and tax collectors. He was no doubt better equipped to create a literary masterpiece. This he did because it seemed good to me also so to put in order. These are his prominent justifications over his predecessors. In the introduction to his translation of the Gospel of St. Luke, a Christian scholar, J.B. Phillips, has this to say. On his own admission, Luke has carefully compared and edited existing material. But it would seem that he had access to a good deal of additional material, and we can reasonably guess at some of the sources from which he drew. And yet you call this the word of God? Obtain the Gospels in modern English, in soft cover by Fontana Publications. It is a cheap edition. Get it quickly before the Christians decide to have Philip's invaluable notes expunged from his translation. And do not be surprised if the authors of the RSV also decide to eliminate the preface from their translation. It is an old, old habit. As soon as those who have vested interests in Christianity realize that they have inadvertently let the cat out of the bag, they quickly make amends. They make my current references past history overnight. The remaining gospel. Who is the author of the Gospel of St. John? See what he says about himself in John chapter 19 verse 35 and chapter 21 verses 24 and 25. Who is his he and his and this and his we know and I suppose. Could it be the fickle one who left him in the lurch in the garden, when he was most in need or the fourteenth man at the table at the last supper, the one that Jesus loved? Both were John's. It was a popular name among the Jews in the time of Jesus and among Christians even now. Neither of these two was the author of this gospel. That it was the product of an anonymous hand is crystal clear. Authors in a nutshell. Let me conclude this authorship search 
with the verdict of those 32 scholars backed by their 50 cooperating denominations. God had been eliminated from this authorship race long ago. In the RSV by Collins, invaluable notes on the books of the Bible are to be found at the back of their production. I am reproducing only a bit of that information here. We start with Genesis, the first book of the Bible. The scholars say about its author, one of the five books of Moses. Note the words five books of Moses are written in inverted commas. This is a subtle way of admitting that this is what people say, that it is the book of Moses, that Moses was its author. But we, the 32 scholars who are better informed, do not subscribe to that tittle tattle. The next four books, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. Author? Generally credited to Moses. This is the same category as the book of Genesis. Who is the author of the book of Judges? Answer? Possibly Samuel. Who is the author of Ruth? Answer? Not definitely known and who is the author of First Samuel? Answer, author unknown. Second Samuel. Answer, author unknown. First King. Answer, author unknown. Second King. Answer, author unknown. First Chronicles. Answer, author unknown, probably. Second Chronicles. Answer, author likely collected. And so the story goes. The authors of these anonymous books are either unknown or are probably or likely or are of doubtful origin. Why blame God for this fiasco? The long-suffering and merciful God did not wait for 2,000 years for Bible scholars to tell us that he was not the author of Jewish peccadillos, prides and prejudices, of their lusts, wranglings, jealousies and enormities. He said it openly what they do. And woe to those who write the book with their own hands. And then say, this is from Allah, to traffic with it for a miserable price. So woe to them for what their hands do write, and woe to them for what they earn thereby. Holy Quran, Surah Baqarah, Chapter 2, Verse 79 We could have started the thesis of this book with the above Quranic verse and ended with it, with the satisfaction that God Almighty had himself delivered his verdict on the subject is the Bible God's word. But we wish to afford our Christian brethren an opportunity to study the subject as objectively as they wished, allowing believing Christians, reborn Christians, and their own holy book and the Bible to testify against their better judgment. What about the Holy Quran? Is the Quran the word of God? The author of this humble publication has endeavored to answer this question in a most scientific manner in his book, Al-Qur'an, The Miracle of Miracles. End of chapter 9 End of Is the Bible God's Word?